For thousands of years, this spring was sacred to the ancient tribes of Britain. Depicted here as a holy trinity, the Celtic goddess Sulis presided over the spring at Bath. When the Romans arrived in Britain, they dedicated the shrine to Minerva, their goddess of wisdom and good health. Ancient myths describe it as a place of prophecy, as well as healing, where the pools were said to offer up visions. The Romans didn't destroy the religions of the peoples they conquered. They too took the healing waters and dreamed by the hot pools. They too believed that nature was sacred and the spirit of the earth goddess was alive in all things. women continued the ancient traditions of the old religions with a thousand small ceremonies in their daily lives. They were leaders, counselors, visionaries, and healers. In Europe, their villages knew them as wise women. The Christian church and state branded them witches, and condemned them as worshippers of the devil. Their history, once lost, is being reclaimed by a new generation of women. understanding of witch, let's say, as healer, or witch as the woman alone, the strong woman, the woman in nature, the woman at the edge of social change. All those meanings that we could think of in regard to witch are not the meanings that most people in our society look at. They see witches in terms of evil, they confuse witch with Satanist, they do all those kind of things. Our ideas about witches date back to the Renaissance and the period in history known as the witch craze. By the time it was over, women's power had become associated with darkness and death. On Halloween, the witch is queen of the night. We forget that Halloween was once the pagan festival of Samhain, a time to remember the ancestors. Midnight orgies, satanic rites, and human sacrifice. We have been taught to fear the witch, 
but we are still drawn to her power. Perhaps it's because we remember another time. A time when older women were revered and the conical hat was a symbol of knowledge. A time when the cauldron symbolized the origins of life and the magical power of women. I think one of the reasons why people fear the word witch so much is that it brings up ideas about women's power. And for 5,000 years or longer, we have been propagandized, really, to fear women's power, to fear female power, to see it as something negative, something to be afraid of, something destructive, something evil. And naturally, we have all those associations that come up with the word witch. That's why, for me, it's important to use that word, to bring it up, to say, look, let's bring out into the light all of this stuff. Let's look at it clearly and realize we don't have to fear it. witchcraft has been used to dismiss many cultural traditions, not only in Europe, but around the world. This woman in Brazil is a member of the religion known as the Society of the Alejo. For generations, the women of the Alejo kept alive the traditions of their African ancestors. When the Europeans arrived in Africa and the Americas, women who practiced rituals like these were called heathens and persecuted as witches. We still call these women witch doctors and charlatans. They are the folk healers of Peru, and for centuries they've met in markets like this one. Many of the drugs that stock our pharmacies were first used by female healers. 400 years ago, women like this were burned at the stake for the crime of witchcraft. Balsamo divino, balsamo de sanación. Margarita Vespuedes is a curandera, a Mexican healing witch. Despite years of persecution, women like Margarita have continued to practice as healers. Modern medicine once dismissed techniques like these, but doctors are beginning to re-examine the healing power of the human spirit. Sanos, salvos, se ande. Yo le digo cómo debe de caminar, cómo debe de vivir, cómo debe de protegerse con la palabra de Dios nuestro Señor, el niño Jesús. Like Margarita, many European healers who were burned relied on Christian faith when performing their cures. But their healing arts were rooted in the traditions of their ancestors. Del Hijo del Espíritu Santo. The original word witch, it comes from an Anglo-Saxon root, wick, which means to bend or shape, to bend or shape consciousness and thus to bend or shape events in your life. Essentially, it is the remnants in the West of the old shamanic traditions, the traditions of 
developing within yourself altered states of consciousness without using drugs, without you know, using chemicals, but through meditation and through very, very simple methods like chanting, like singing together. Starhawk is a modern witch. She's here with people from all over North America who celebrate the summer solstice. New pagans feel that they are returning to a pre-Christian tradition that honors both women and nature. Starhawk also lectures at this Catholic college in California. Among her colleagues is Dominican father Matthew Fox. What strikes me is the vehemence uh, of the letters I receive, the hate mail, um, regarding uh, having a, a witch on our faculty. I thought that, that the burning of witches was settled several centuries ago, but People write me and they sign it, a good Christian, an ecumenical Christian, they say, you and your witch friend can burn in hell forever. And um, it's just amazing what this brings up, that there's a lot of buried material in a lot of um, Christians' lives. This cross was erected in Trier, France, in 1132. It was a sign of the times, the symbol of a new religious cult that was sweeping across pagan Europe. Few people realize that the Christianization of Europe resulted in the loss of millions of lives. The Church of Rome set up the Inquisition to enforce its will. People who criticized the Church or held different beliefs were charged with heresy and executed as criminals. In 1554, Marianne Monjou was drowned for calling up the spirits of the Rhine. For this is barbaric and an obscene right of the people, said Abbot Petrarch. Out of those religious persecutions came the witch hunts. 85% of those killed for the crime of witchcraft were women. Between the 15th and 17th centuries, thousands were burned in squares like this all over Europe. We're never told this, but this was the women's holocaust. We did have a women's holocaust, and this was it. In terms of how many women were burned, it's very hard to get numbers. The, the high number that people use is 9 million over 300 or more years. So that there were huge, huge numbers of people who were burned and people who were, were killed by the Inquisition. They left no written records. They shared no common grave. They took with them their stories, their beliefs, and the traditions of our pagan ancestors. The witch craze involved the destruction of a way of life that had endured for thousands of years. In villages all over feudal Europe, women and men worked side by side. Theirs was a religion of rural life and changing seasons. 
of oral traditions and beliefs passed on within families. We still call the earth our mother, a memory of the goddess traditions of our pagan past. For generations, people have climbed this hill in England to celebrate the arrival of spring. It's May Day, and the Morris men are waking up the earth with their staves and bells. Once, long ago, the Queen of the May presided over the celebrations. Rituals like this one were part of the religious practices of the majority of people in Europe until at least 1700. They were among the traditions targeted as witchcraft. What's really important to think about when you think about goddess religions and when you think about pagan religions is that most pagan peoples lived on a particular part of the land they had ceremonies and traditions and goddesses that were appropriate and gods that were appropriate to them at a certain time. They made their rituals and their celebrations as things that were important because they were part of life experience. They helped the crops grow, they helped the animals come in, they helped talk about the relationship of the moon and the stars and the planets. And they really didn't have a lot to do with belief. They are based on action experience, celebration, custom. With the arrival of Christianity, belief became a way of life. Everywhere in Europe, churches were built over pagan shrines, and goddesses were turned into saints. Before the Christians came, people walked to a remote village in France to worship this Celtic goddess. Even after she was renamed Saint Foy, she was said to dispense healing to thousands of pilgrims, just as all mother goddesses in the past had done. But while the Christian church allowed for saints, it offered no divine goddess to adore. The newly converted pagans found one of their own and demanded that she be recognized. There's no question that in the Middle Ages, Mary was understood as a goddess figure. This is explicit in the writings of Mechthilde Magdeburg, a 13th century Beguine laywoman, who in fact ended her life as a nun, a uh, very politically active woman, kept a journal, which we have today. And several times in that journal, she calls Mary goddess. And she was attacked by many of the clergy for saying that, but she never took it back. Furthermore, was that within 100 years, over 500 churches the size of cathedrals were constructed all over Europe, like Chartres Cathedral. And every one of them was dedicated to Mary. Now, you have to meditate on the phenomenon of this. You know, what can get a whole civilization, a whole people, to bring together its laborers, its artists, its bishops, its financiers, its architects, everybody to do one thing over a hundred year period. To this day, Mary still bears the names of her pagan ancestors. Queen of Heaven, Lady of the World, Mother of God. We can see that there were two kinds of religion. There was the religion of the, e of the elite, the formal Catholic church religion and then there was the popular religion of the ordinary people who were by far the overwhelming majority of people in France and their religion w was still full of the old religion 
the goddess religion, the nature religion, the religion of spirits. The most famous visionary of her age was Joan of Arc. In 1429, she led the French to victory over the English after a hundred years of war. Two years later, she was condemned as a heretic and a witch by the same church that would eventually elevate her to sainthood. Prophetic and valiant in battle, the French later wrote of how her presence, goddess-like, had won and inspired them. A magic tree, a hilltop shrine, and a sacred spring in the countryside of France all played a part in Joan's early life. It was here she first heard the voices that would help her lead the French to battle. Joan gave her voices the names of Catholic saints, but her faith was deeply rooted in the old religion. She claimed that her voices gave her an authority greater than that of the church. In fact, at the time that she was a girl, it was not unusual for women to take prophetic roles, to be visionary leaders or to be mystics. So she wasn't inventing this. This was part of the background that she grew up in as a possibility for women. And she was relying on individual inspiration, a direct pipeline. That wasn't acceptable. If people could rely on direct pipelines they wouldn't need the church fathers anymore they wouldn't need the institutional church they wouldn't need the whole system of authority that was theological but was also related to all kinds of other areas of life besides spiritual practice that was a direct challenge to the most important structures of authority of that time By Joan's time, the church was increasingly rigid. It was increasingly on the defensive. And it got more and more doctrinaire, more and more concerned to quash dissent, to quash difference. It was more and more threatened by it because of the changes that were taking place in the broader society. By the 15th century, in villages like this one in France, the old order was changing. For thousands of years, women had been the physicians of the people. They understood the principles of anatomy and nutrition. They birthed babies and held the dying in their arms. Priests fumed as the village wise woman received the honor and gratitude the church claimed for God alone. The witches, the wise women, the healers, were always also the counselors. It's like a whole other tradition of knowledge and learning that has been suppressed because it had political implications. The Inquisition announced that no one did more harm to the Catholic faith than midwives. They eased the pain of labor, God's punishment for Eve's sin. They interfered with God's will through the use of birth control and abortion. New laws proclaimed that any woman who dared cure without having studied was a witch and must die. Since most women were barred from university, the rise of the male medical profession was guaranteed. Women continued to practice, but now they did so in fear of their lives. It was the testimony of male doctors that sent many to their deaths.
The witch burnings were a way to take control of women's powers of reproduction, which of course includes sexuality, and women's powers over reproduction, which could include midwifery, um, contraception, abortion, women's control of women's bodies and reproductive issues. This is part of a process of housewifeization, of domestication of women that took place over several centuries but it began in the same period as the witch burnings. It was a time of social upheaval. As trade expanded, landowners pressed for the confiscation of peasant land. People rebelled as they were driven off their farms and into cities and towns. Those who demanded reform were branded enemies of God. Charges of witchcraft followed hot on the heels of peasant rebellions. Repression increased. Anyone considered helpless, mysterious, or aberrant was victimized, and punishments became public spectacles. Many suffered, but women suffered most of all. Those who spoke out wore the mask of shame. If they gathered in groups, they were plotting against men. Husbands were advised from the pulpit to beat their wives, not in rage, but out of charity for her soul. Those who made a dress too ornate wore the dressmaker's collar. Those who fell asleep in church, the rosary necklace. Others faced the ducking stool. The mere fact that uh, women are singled out particularly, I think, says something about our society, about our culture, which, to a large extent, uh, is misogynist. Uh, we get it even in the New Testament, in uh, the writings of St. Paul, that it is woman who introduces uh, sin, it is woman who is the temptress, in a sense it's woman who is the cause of the fall. So there's a very, very strong uh, element of this, uh, both in the New Testament and certainly right throughout uh, the Christian period. Guilt and sin were now part of every Christian's life. Sexuality was no longer a gift, but the root of all evil, and woman was the obstacle to man's holiness. From every pulpit, celibate priests declared that the end of the world was at hand. The pious would go to heaven, the wicked would burn in hell. St. Thomas Aquinas wrote that next to contemplating God, the greatest pleasure for the blessed ones in heaven would be watching the tortures of the eternally damned. In the 14th century, the end of the world arrived in the form of the Black Plague. It was followed by a series of epidemics that swept across Europe for the next 200 years. The priests said it was God's punishment for sin but their sacraments did not ease the suffering. People turned to the village wise woman in search of help and comfort. Peculiar things happened at the end of the 15th and beginning of the 16th century. Namely, it would seem that the female population increased more rapidly than the male population why this was so it's difficult to uh, ascertain possibly extensive war saw the decimation of male numbers some have argued that women were more immune to diseases that were rampant at the time including the plague so that you would uh, develop this kind of disproportion within the population now the importance of that in a patriarchal society is that women begin to outlive men and not only that women 
because of their excessive numbers, do not find husbands. They don't marry and become, willy-nilly, independent. And in a patriarchal society, this is a very, very difficult thing to come to grips with. By the 16th century, women's rights to inherit and own property had been eroded. Many women became dependent on charity for survival. Those who held on to their property were objects of suspicion and envy. At a time when life expectancy was 40 years, just being old was suspect. Widows, spinsters, and those who begged for a living were the most vulnerable to charges of witchcraft. They were easy scapegoats for communities plagued by war and disease. These were centuries of incredible strife, uncertainty, clash between Protestant and Catholic, and most important, a kind of groundswell of anti-clerical feeling. It strikes me that the witch craze is a kind of an answer for institutions which feel threatened. In other words, if one could convince uh, the lower classes that their difficulties arose from the fact that witches were present and were blighting the harvests, were causing barrenness uh, in the marriage bed, what have you, uh, it would sort of take the, the pressure off the establishment. It's not the state, it's not the Pope, it's not the bishop who is the cause of your anguish. It's the cursed presence of the witches. She flew through the night air on missions of destruction. And everything she touched turned to death and disease. She was the hag, the devil's agent, the poisoner, the one with the evil eye. This false image of a witch as, a, as an old hag, first of all, the witches were not all old. The women who were burned were not all old. There were some old women. There were a lot of children. Uh, it certainly affected how we look at women today, and it's used as a great put-down that women are hags, Hag used to uh, mean sacred knowledge, a woman who had sacred knowledge. Uh, old women used to be uh, revered because they did have this ancient knowledge and sacred knowledge and passed it on to others so that it was uh, wonderful to be an old woman. There is evidence that women did meet in groups to participate in the old rituals and to exchange news. But as the witch persecutions reached their height, meetings like these became more and more dangerous. Women who gathered at night were thought to be evil, an idea reinforced by the art and literature of the time. It was an age of superstition, and so no one doubted the existence of witches. It was difficult not to believe when thousands were being burned. Historians call it the Renaissance and Reformation, a time of rebirth in art and learning. An age of church reform. It was also the dawn of the scientific revolution. The telescope was invented and a new world was discovered. 
The scientific revolution relied explicitly and heavily on the techniques of the Inquisition, the techniques of questioning witches in the witch burnings. Francis Bacon, who's one of the fathers of the scientific method and one of the leading exponents of the scientific revolution, talked about how important it was to use the techniques of the Inquisition to tease or torture the secrets out of Mother Earth or Mother Nature. It was an age that marked the rise of the bureaucratic state and the emergence of capitalism. In cities all over Europe, a new profit ethic was beginning to take hold. The witch hunts were a business. They were profitable. For each witch trial, there'd be meticulous bookkeeping. Every single step of the witch trial would be costed. There'd be a charge for going and getting the witch and seizing her. There'd be a charge for escorting her. There'd be a charge for locking her up and guarding her. There'd be a charge for someone to bring her meals if she were given, given meals. There'd be a charge for someone to keep the books of all of these charges. Every single step generated costs, and those costs had to be paid by somebody. If the witch had any property at all, her property would pay those costs. Her assets would be confiscated and seized. She not only had to pay the bills for her own capture, imprisonment, torture, and execution, but there was a whole secondary industry that sprang up around the witch burnings. First, it provided amazing employment opportunities for lawyers, for judges, for people who would sit on the tribunals. Now anyone could be accused. And the witch hunts were well-organized campaigns. One accusation by a neighbor set the wheels in motion. When a woman was uh, accused of being a witch and went in front of the Inquisition, uh, she'd be in jail, first of all. She may have been tortured first. Would have been out in the town square or in front of the town church. Because we're not talking about cities. This all happened in rural areas. Most of the witches were in rural areas, almost all of them. So it's a small town thing. Everybody comes out to look. The witch is brought out. She is, first of all, stripped of her clothes because uh, she may have a spell in her clothes or something sewn into the hem which is made out of the skin of an unbaptized child or something like that. So she's stripped of all her clothes. Uh, she's shaved. Uh, both her, the hair on her head and her pubic hair are shaved because uh, hair has always been thought to have a, a lot of power, even, you know, we know the myths of Samson and so on. Uh, but also that women, when they braided their hair, were thought to braid men's fate with the, this kind of thing. So it was, a very, it was a magic technique. So she had all her hair removed. But she had to approach the Inquisitor walking backwards so she can't give him the evil eye. And the Inquisitor is uh, somebody who is from the city. Uh, he's been appointed by the church or in later times by the, uh, the ruler or whoever was in charge. So this poor rural woman who turns around to face this man that she may never have seen anything like that before in her life, he probably speaks much better French or English or whatever than she does. So the witch approaching the, the Inquisitor is just totally dumbfounded, has no idea what's happening to her. Many could not withstand the methods of torture used to extract confessions. Enclosure in the Iron Maiden was like being buried alive. Frederick von Spee, a Jesuit priest, disillusioned by what he saw as a confessor to condemned witches, wrote, Why do you search so diligently for sorcerers? Take the Jesuits, all the religious orders, and torture them. They will confess. If some deny, repeat it a few times they will confess. Should a few still be obstinate, exorcise them, shave them, only keep on torturing, they will give in. 
take the canons, the doctors, the bishops of the church. They will all confess. They were tortured three times. The first time, a lot of people got through and didn't confess. By the end of the second time, virtually everybody confessed because the torture was absolutely monstrous. Uh, and then we have the question of the third degree. We get that term in English from the fact that this third level of torture would uh, virtually, uh, if they didn't kill the people, everybody confessed. The torturer made her sit on the rack, undressed her, and applied the thumbscrews. When the thumbscrews were applied to her toes, she cried out louder than before. The inquisitor inserted the mouth pair and demanded that she confess. When it was removed, she told her story. Ten years ago, it happened that the devil came to her in the guise of a man. First they danced, and then they dined, and then she and others knelt before the goat and kissed him. Here she named eight neighbors. Only one letter, written in 1590 by Rebecca Lemp, survives. O oh, husband, they take me from thee by force. How can God suffer it? My heart is nearly broken. Alas, alas, my poor dear children orphaned. Husband, send me something that I might die, or I must expire under torture. If thou canst not today, do it tomorrow. Write to me directly, R.L. Near the city of Trier, two entire villages were exterminated. In another, only two people were spared. It took the church 200 years of terror and death to transform the image of paganism into devil worship and folk culture into heresy. The days when Europeans met under the fairy tree to dance and sing and celebrate the rites of spring were disappearing. The devil was afoot in the land. He was conjured up in fields and forest groves, and his demons were led by women. Pagan celebrations that once affirmed the people's connection to the land gradually took the guise of secular carnivals, and the festivities were led by men.
The European world had been turned upside down. The wild-horned god of the old religion had been transformed into the devil, and women were said to be more susceptible to his charms. Women were irrational. They were driven by their passions. If sexuality was a sin, then woman was the greatest sinner of all. Because women were, by definition, sexual, women were also dangerous. And women could be in league with the devil because, after all, all of these dangerous and wicked and threatening and ungodly and unchurchly things must have come from the devil. The devil had by then got elevated to God's worthy opponent. There had been changes in church doctrine that made the devil almost the other side of the coin of God. When a woman reportedly signed a contract with the devil, it was generally finalized uh, with some sexual act. The interesting thing is that whereas witchcraft is found uh, in areas stretching from northern Italy all the way to Scandinavia, women who confess to this, because we still have the trial records, generally indicate that sexual union with the devil is a very, very painful thing. It's never enjoyable. Apparently, the devil's member is icy and frigid. Now, this caused a great deal of consternation. If there wasn't such a thing as witchcraft, how come all these women respond in the same way? And remember, we're in the 16th century. There is no such thing as radio, telephone, TV. These are very, very remote communities and villages. Why do women respond in the same way when they're interrogated? Mind you, it isn't all that mysterious. The interrogators were all supplied with handbooks, the type of questions to pose. The most popular handbook was the Malleus Malefaciarum, the hammer against witches. It was one of the first books to achieve mass distribution, thanks to the invention of the printing press. most nefarious book ever done on how to burn a witch was done by not one but two Dominicans, Malleus Malefaciarum, in the late 15th century. And I've studied the book and it's, um, it's unbelievable. Uh, it's, about, it's, a, it's a pure study of repression and projection, therefore. And so it's a highly sexual book and um, it's, it's all about the projection of, of men onto um, to others. The fear of their own sexuality, the fear of the night, the fear of the dark, um, the fear of women, all of it comes, comes out very strong. But that book was extremely influential. Commissioned by Pope Innocent VIII, the Malleus singled out women as the primary source of witchcraft. Maybe, um, Maybe my, my lifetime is dedicated to uh, repairing the sins of my fathers, you see. And, uh... No monuments have been built to their memory. Only a few relics, like the witch's cart, remain to mark their passing. People of Trier still gather together in the town square. Few remember the horrors that took place here just 300 years ago. Most people have forgotten that women like this once lived in a state of terror. And that six generations of children watched as their mothers burned at the stake.
History is written by the winners. We don't remember those who died on Halloween, and fairy tales are the only stories we tell our children about the women once called witches. I think all day that witches make potion, potions, so you can, so that, and then at night they give it to you, and then they take you to wherever they live, and they put you in a cage, and they make you your slaves. I think that there are good witches and bad witches. And I think a, witch, a bad witch would maybe look a bit old and, and uh, wrinkly. And I think maybe a good witch would be young and all uh, beautiful. I think a witch is something that comes out of the ground at Halloween and it gives everybody magical powers. The effects of the burning times are still with us. Every year on October 31st, groups of women all over North America remember those who died. By performing rituals like this one, many women feel they are finding the strength to fight for what they believe. It's first very difficult to find out what is our own experience, to find our own authority, to find our own voice. and. Secondly, once we've found it, it's very hard to hang on to it. It's hard to remain true to it. And it's also very scary when we think about what often happens to women when we do find our own voices and we proclaim our own experience and our own truth and we refuse to tell lies about it and to submit. Women are once again gathering together. They're looking to the future. A future in which the voices of women will be heard. And the power of women will no longer be feared. When women get in touch with our own power from within, we find that we do have the ability to do many, many things. And that kind of power is not competitive. It's not hierarchical. If I have the ability to do something, it doesn't mean you don't. For me, part of my commitment to women's spirituality has also been a very active political commitment. You can't go off and meditate and think you're going to affect things that way. You have to act in this world to bring about the changes that you want. So me and also the groups that I work with here have been very much involved in doing political work around the issues of peace and militarism and ecology. Being spiritual doesn't buy you out of doing all the nitty-gritty work that needs to be done. <laughs>